Okay, we're live now, but remember, there's a 20 second. Yes, delay. a little delay. So, 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 if I spotlight my video, my video should be the only one showing now. Is, is that happening? It's coming up right now. Okay. Okay, we're live now. Oh, wait, the old yeah. thing just came up. Yeah, so you're just, it's just you, Eric. Yeah. Wait. Okay. And then, and then when I cancel it, it goes back to kind of regular mode or whatever. Okay, wait, Will, a weird thing. Mine is showing up as our last webinar, 2 p.m. on my YouTube link. No, I'm looking at, I'm looking at Eric right now. So yeah. the link that I got. I don't, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then, that was weird. Oh, you're on a different we're, YouTube thing. We're uh, we're all broadcasting live to the world right now. So just okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Great. <laughs> I I had a strange link originally, but I'm happy okay. to be on. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I when I share screen, let's just make sure that is popping up. So everyone out there who uh, we've got eight people watching right now, welcome you guys. Uh, if you want to put your maybe names and where you're at in the chat, that would be great and say good morning. We still have about eight minutes or so before we start and we're just obviously testing some stuff out. So Eric, yeah, that looks great. You're uh, okay. up, in the, up in the corner and um, the slide looks great. So you're okay. good. Okay, perfect. Yep. All right, so I can do that from here. All righty. I think we're good to go. So I can just I, I can just pop that slide up there for now. Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh huh. Now we're in the right place. You good, Homa? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had a little scare on my link. I have to say, but I'm all good now. Okay. The wonders of modern technology. I know. Ain't it great? Sometimes. It is. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> so I want it, it's I want, great when it is. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Hey, it's Michelle. great when it's great. Yeah. Hey, Michelle from Sri Lanka. It's great to see you here. Mm. We know Michelle well. She's part of our master. Oh, good hey, morning. Michelle. Dr. Kleiss. You know what? Before I forget, I'm going to start recording. Um, I just, I can edit it later, but I'd just rather do that than forget it. <laughs> and it's nice to have some good uh, Pennsylvania representation early before we get started. Yeah, if I would, if, from... if, if, uh, if I ever had a little extra bandwidth whenever <laughs> that might happen. It doesn't look like it's likely in our future, but um, it would be great to, uh, to just, there's a lot of production stuff you can do with this. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, can, you can basically create your own TV channel, which is really cool. So that would be fun, but. Well, you have a few hours between now oh, and then. Uh, I, have, I have many <laughs> things to accomplish today, believe me. Hey, Kristen, how are you? Good to see you. I think we've met in the past at some point, I think. Um, hopefully you're doing well in Melbourne in the uh, middle of winter down there. And oh, wonderful. I've been there quite a bit. Yeah, well, you're getting a PhD at the University of Tasmania, aren't you? Isn't I am, I am. <laughs> How'd you wrangle that? That's pretty yeah, cool. <laughs> I can, in, in, in gospel music of all things. There you go. Wow, <laughs> that's awesome. Small world. Yes. That's got to be a story, Eric. I'm sure how oh, one would end one. up yes, in Tasmania. Yes, yes. Oh yeah. And uh, we have Layla from Abu Dhabi is here. Oh, that's great, Layla. You have the same name spelling as my daughter, Layla. There are about 
a dozen ways to spell the name Layla. <laughs> and um, I don't see a lot of people in the Middle East with the L-A-Y-L-A, -L -A, but we, we chose that because it was sort of the easiest way to pronounce it in where we are. Um, so that's kind of fun. So again, if you're just joining us, we will be starting here in about five minutes. Um, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to having a conversation today with you guys. Thanks for coming. What are the chat waterfall? That's right. Yeah. We love the chat waterfall. One of your favorite phrase. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as people are entering, we love to hear where you're signing in from, say hello. And uh, we already are covering the globe this, mor this morning in East Coast and Central Time US, which is where the presenters are checking in from. Very early mm -hmm. for, <laughs> for Eric. <laughs> and Steelers fans are already making connections. So oh, yeah. <laughs> I see that. <laughs> India and the UK, as we have some more people coming in. So um, welcome everyone. Uh, we're going to start here in probably about two or three minutes. We'll give it a couple minutes past the hour since it is early. Well, it's early for us, but <laughs> probably everyone else is awake around the world. But yes, um, from Vietnam. Let me Very get... exciting. Thanks to those of you who are also tuning in at dinner time. By the end of the day, sometimes it just doesn't feel very exciting to get on a YouTube or a Zoom, but yep. here you are. So yep. thanks. So Eric, you changed. You just changed your screen. You know. Oh, I'm sorry. Did that? We're, that yeah, we're seeing something that. different. So so sorry. Let me get us back on the on the thing here. Oh, Luxembourg and Oakland. Amon Jordan. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us. Also, I just want to say before we begin, we heard wonderful responses, big questions from people um, who signed in and shared so many concerns. And um, it was really great to hear from you, from all the people who signed up for this, um, you know, what, what kinds of questions come to you and 
there are a lot. So uh, thank you. Also, Oklahoma. Yeah, this definitely is the international, the international group right here. Yeah, it's very exciting. <laughs> From Sri Lanka to Switzerland, Pittsburgh and Tulsa. <laughs> found poetry. I should have tried to work that into this song yeah. this morning. Well, that kind of goes with your opening, right? So It definitely does. Camille, good to see you. So we're going to start here in about one minute. Um, and if you're just joining us, if you just want to say hi in the chat, that would be great. Um, but Homa and Eric will begin officially here in about a minute or so. All right. Joyce Valenza, great to see you. Hope you're doing well. We have, it's been way too long. And our good friends from Brasilia are here. We work with a lot of wonderful educators in Brasilia from a couple of schools. So that's exciting. Michigan, Reston. I know Reston pretty well. St. Louis, Atlanta. And Camille, in your beautiful country home in France, it's great to have you. Nova Scotia, Chapel Hill. Fantastic. Oh, hi, Lee. <laughs> oh, is that Lee here from Chapel Hill? Yeah. Wonderful. Good morning, Lee. That's my friend from probably 25 years ago. Wow. <clears throat> All right. Well, why don't, ahead, why don't we go ahead and get started since it is a couple minutes after the top of the hour and we could probably just continue to say hi to everybody as they, as they come. <laughs> they're, they're welcome. But um, thanks so much, you guys, for for coming to this really important conversation that um, we hope uh, over the next 45 minutes or so will not only uh, get you thinking, but also inspire you and to, uh, to just kind of get our brains wrapped around this moment a little bit more fully. Um, just to let you know, uh, Eric and Homa will be presenting for about 45 minutes or so, and then we're going to take some questions at the very end. Uh, I'm going to be kind of the chat captain this morning, and uh, so I'll be kind of collecting your questions, and we can have a little bit of a conversation. As Homa uh, alluded to earlier, though, there were, I think, probably hundreds of questions that people left when they registered that were amazing, and uh, we're, we're thinking about actually trying to put together a podcast um, and have even more of those questions as a discussion, so hopefully you can look forward to that. Um, and just so you know, this is sponsored by the Big Questions Institute and also the Oneness Lab, and there'll be more information around that as well and a follow-up email that you'll get with a link to this, uh, to this archive. So with all of that, I'm just going to turn it over to Eric and Homa, and if uh, you have any questions, just put them in the chat. So take it away. Wonderful. Good morning, everybody. It's so good to see all of you here. Um, you know, we, we like to start off with a little bit of centering. And one of the ways that we do that is with music. And so before we even get into all of the heavy content that we're going to get into today, uh, we just want to we, we just want to bring some uh, a little focus to the space. And uh, I always tell people to uh, to to sing along, but keep your uh, your microphones, you know, <laughs> if, if, if you're in here. So um, here we go. This land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York Islands, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream water, this land was made for you and me. As 
as I went walking that ribbon of highway, I saw above me that endless skyway. I saw below me that golden valley. This land was made for you and me. This land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York Islands, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was made for you and me. This land. again. I'm going to turn it over to my dear friend, Homa. Thank you so much, Eric. It is such a treat. It's so rare in our work and professional development to have these interludes of centering and the heart. And um, that is one of many real privileges um, of getting to work with you and having this, this other side of um, <laughs> our literacy to come out. So that really is a great way to start. So thank you, Eric. Thanks everyone tuning in from literally all over the world. Um, it, it is very exciting to be with you and to share um, in a very short time, we want to touch on these themes of racial literacy and particularly thinking about the empathy gap, what that is, why it's important to understand a little bit of the origins and how it seeps into our lives every day. Mm. And so um, we want to begin acknowledging this moment that we're living in. Um, certainly, here we are all online with its bumps and some benefits um, and stresses of living in quarantine uh, during the coronavirus. And you know what we think of as a twin pandemic, the epidemic of racism, this 400 year um, experience of racial injustice that the world feels like it is waking up to. It's not just an American problem, but it is really globally, people are waking up. And so we're kind of in a moment of what feels like awakening. Mm -hmm. So you woke up, that's a, that's a good thing. So, 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 so happy about that. But you know, the real question becomes, are you ready? Are you ready to get out of that bed? And I, I always think about this story. I was probably the worst kid uh, to, to wake up in the mornings. I hated getting out of the bed. And I remember my mom coming into my room uh, to get me up for school. I, I can hear her now. Eric, are you up? Yes, ma'am, I'm awake. You know, I know you're awake, but are you up? Are you out of that bed? I, I'm awake, mama, I'm awake. I know that, but are you up? Did you, did you take your shower? Did you brush your teeth? Did you comb your hair? Did you iron your clothes? Are you dressed? Are you ready to walk out the door? 
you know, and I know that in this age, you know, everyone likes to let everybody know how woke they may be. But as we all know, waking up in the morning is hardly ever a glamorous affair. I mean, <laughs> come on, like it took me two hours to just comb my hair this morning. <laughs> so it takes work to actually leave the house uh, and, and, and get to work. And we know that. So. So in this process of, you know, we are celebrating this awakening, but we also have to wonder what did it take to get us here? And in many cases, organizations, government agencies, schools are, are saying, watching George Floyd be murdered in public, watching that knee press on his neck for eight mm. minutes and 46 seconds jolted us. And it makes us wonder, you know, how much more violence, murder, disenfranchisement, does it, does it take to jar us into awareness? And mm -hmm. so we woke up, but you know, there is somewhat of an empathy gap because this question is not new. This sort mm -hmm. of violence is not new. We have mm -hmm. been living with um, decades and decades of protest movement and um, we wanna also take a moment to um, acknowledge this week, um, the passing of Congressman John Lewis um, and Eric, sorry, I think we have to advance that slide. Yeah, I'm, mm -hmm. just sorry a little about technical that. things on the end, I got you. Okay, sorry about that. So, mm -hmm. so the question is, um, why did it take so long? And just in the life of John Lewis, we see from as a young man, six dick decades ago, marching with Dr. King, um, organizing, six decades of his life were dedicated to civil rights. Um, but for many people that we talk to in schools, in lots of diverse organizations, in the workplace, in very woke kind of uh, university settings, there is this waking up that literally has just happened amidst the pandemic. So we have to ask, why did it take so long? And we think that a lot of it does have to do with um, an empathy gap, that um, it is a gap in perception in how we see people, that there is somewhat of a process of othering. And it's not that we don't see Black people, it's how we see Black people. Mm -hmm. And we need to be conscious of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's how we've been seeing Black people and, and, and making Blackness mean a certain thing uh, that has gotten us to this point. We've been swimming in stereotypes and misinformation and quite honestly, uh, a ton of lies about who Black people are. Uh, so, so we want to take a, a, a little bit, a little bit of a moment uh, to see how this happened. And so, um, uh, Dr. Robin D.G. Kelly, uh, professor of American history at UCLA, said it this way: He said, "Race is never just about uh, just a matter of how you look. It's about how people assign meaning to how you look." And so, with that, we ask the question: Like, uh, uh, you know, what? have what environment are we are, are we living in and what has that environment done to tell us what it means to be black or who black people are in uh and so uh the preeminent american scholar uh and and not just american but international scholar uh w.e.b du bois said it this way he said but in the propaganda against the negro since emancipation we face one of the most stupendous efforts the world ever saw to discredit human beings, an effort involving universities, history, science, social life, and religion. And so we have a little exercise that we'd like to engage you in this morning. Now, if you could just type into the chat a one word description of what you see in this image, describe the people in this image for me. And I'll just give you about you know 30 seconds, just pop, the first thing that comes to your mind when you see those image. 
and we realized there's a little bit of a delay between our Zoom presentation and then what um, instructions people get. Mm -hmm. So we'll take a yeah, few we'll more. we'll take a little bit to see some of those descriptions pop up. Okay, mm -hmm. here they. Come. Yeah, I see a couple starting to pop up on my end. Animalistic children. Uh, ridicule, buckwheat was one. Yeah, so which is you know that's an interesting reference. Frivolous, exploited children, junk, comic, factory dehumanization, humiliation, children, trash. That's good. I I, lo I love when people jump in and participate so so we're going to keep moving but but thank you for doing that i'll show you another little flyer that was floating around about around the, around the time of the advent of rock and roll and this is how black music was described um which which in turn was also describing the cultural production of the people they said the screaming idiotic words and savage music of these records are undermining the morals of our white youth in America. And so, yeah, you have an ad, uh, you know, from around the 1840s and you have this one around the 1940s. And of course, not much changed in between that. And you might be saying, but that was a long time ago, right? Well, let's take a look at this picture. This is the cover of Vogue magazine. And I, there are a couple of things I want you to notice. Notice uh, LeBron James. And uh, if you don't know who LeBron James is, he's, he's, he's probably one of the most prolific basketball players ever. Uh, notice his mouth. Notice, uh, uh, look, at, look, at, look at his shoes, the white tips of his shoes and the white tips of the toes of the ape. Um, uh, notice, uh, you know, notice, uh, the basketball in his, in his, uh, in his right hand with, in the club compared, look at the, the white woman that he's holding and even look at the color of her dress. And, uh, you know, as a note, uh, the, the stereotype of the brute is a very common racial trope used to refer to the viciousness of black men and their propensity for raping white women. This is the same stereotype that was used as the go-to excuse for many of the lynchings that have occurred uh, in the United States. And it's not just here. If you're thinking that it's just here, uh, you see the image of, of, of Schwartz de Piet uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, all over, you know, all over Europe, um, uh, representing, uh, you know, Santa's sidekick. You see the Prada fiasco and the image of the monkey again, if you, if you recognize that face, uh, even as far away as, um, as, as Iran, you see this image of Haji Firuz uh, uh, that, is, that is very common. It's the same image that you saw in the, in, the, in the first slide that we showed. And not only that, you see senators, prime ministers and celebrities all taking part in this long tradition of the defamation of black people by performing in black face, making caricature uh, of the culture. What makes that so dangerous is that when you can dehumanize a group of people like that, when you can literally turn them into cartoons, they cease to be human and you begin to treat them as if they have no feeling. I don't know if you know uh, the, the good Dr. J. Marion Sims, uh, but if you have been following the news in the last couple of years, people have been advocating uh, to take down his statue. He's known as the father of modern gynecology. He has a statue in South Carolina. He has one or had one in Central Park. Um, uh, you may have seen some of these images and are wondering why these women are standing in front of his, his statue in New York City dressed this way. And it was because of the way that he came to his great discoveries. From 1844 to 1849, he engaged in some of the most gruesome experimentation on enslaved black women to arrive at a lot of his conclusions. Uh, they, 
uh, speaking about Sims surgeries were performed without anesthesia. And, and they were performed that way based on a belief at the time that black people did not feel pain in the same way, that they were not vulnerable to pain, especially the women, and therefore their pain was ignored. Uh, so talk about say their names. Uh, uh, and we know some of their names, say their names, Anarka and Lucy and Betsy, uh, uh, who uh, Vanessa uh, Gamble refers to as the mothers of modern gynecology. Um, so once again, uh, that even carries over uh, to this day. Uh, a recent study shows that people, including medical personnel, assume that black people feel less pain than white people. Uh, sometimes the target was white, sometimes black, uh, but re the researchers found that white participants, black participants, and nurses, and nursing students assumed that blacks felt less pain than whites. This is a study from 2016. So, you know, when we talk about things changing, these things are still happening because we live with this legacy of separation with this racial empathy gap. So we also can't ignore this moment that we're in. One of the subtexts of the coronavirus crisis is grave racial disparity right now. So this is a University of Michigan, the New York Times has done extensive work at racial inequality of the coronavirus. It's one of the, the themes that we're living in. And you can see that cases per 10,000 people, for black people, it's triple white people. And for Latinos, it's even more at 73 per 10,000. And then it gets even more serious when you look at the Native American rate. So the Latino rate was so high um, at 73 in among Native American uh, populations in Indian lands, that has the highest rate in the United States at 250 cases per 10,000. That is an order of magnitude so much greater. And again, we're talking specifically about the United States, but this is around the world with marginalized, really, I would say invisible populations. Um, and so we have to think about how that empathy gap is playing into all of the uh, elements of our daily life. Mm -hmm. And uh, because most of us on this particular call are probably educators, let's just look at it from the perspective of education. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the States, um, black boys are ex suspended um, at three times the rate of white boys uh, in the school system for the same infraction. Um, uh, but it's twice that for black girls. And, and this is something that is, that is oftentimes overlooked. We, we focus a lot on the men and the boys, but, but the rates of incarceration of black women here, uh, and it's, you know, stems from a perception of who Black women are and have been, you know, you think about the women that 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 Dr. Sims experimented on and all, all of these different things. And what we do see is we see this kind of overly uh, punitive approach uh, to discipline, particularly when it comes to uh, the, the black and brown children in the in the education system. And I've traveled all over the world and I've talked with people in Australia, New Zealand, uh, South America and Europe. And, uh, and I know that, that, that these, these statistics are very, uh, very similar to, to, to what has happened to Aboriginal people in Australia, to the Maori in, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in New Zealand as well. And so uh, D.L. Hughley said this, he said the most dangerous place for black people to live is in, is in white people's imagination. And this is how it becomes dangerous. The lack of contact combined with the absence of true intimacy and compound, compounded by the power dynamic has people deciding the destinies of other people with whom they have little to no intimate contact. Um, you know, me and uh, Homer love to uh, uh, kind of bring the comedians in 
uh, to this discussion uh, because sometimes they can, you know, they can say it uh, a lot better than we can. And here's brother Chris Rock. We live in a crazy time where Dr. King and Mr. Mandela's dreams are coming true. And black people and white people and Asians and Indians and everybody's hanging out together to have interracial posses. It's unbelievable what's going on, man. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. It's unbelievable. All my black friends have a bunch of white friends. And all my white friends have one black friend. So what Chris Rock is actually pointing to is a serious study um, that found that three quarters of white people in America, and I'm sure globally, uh, mm -hmm. do not have any non-white friends. And um, it gets even more serious. It's not just having a friend, it's how close are those friends. And so I just stumbled on a statistic in the New York Times last weekend that cited a study that showed that 3.7% of whites were close enough to black people to include them in their wedding parties. So in the other way of looking at it is more than 96% of white people who have a wedding party do not have a black friend close enough to include among their friends in the wedding party. And that's just really a reflection of an intimacy, a relationship that is expressed in that empathy gap. It's a long legacy. Um, and that's sort of how we want to make this connection. And then reflect back. Let's think about if there's a racial empathy gap in many institutions, including in our friendships, that means it hits us really hard in the classroom. And it can inhibit a fruitful process like design thinking. And in this design thinking process, which many of you are probably familiar with, you know that it kicks off with empathy, that without empathy, it is not an innovative, fruitful process. You need psychological safety, you need empathy, and those are the kinds of things that if you don't have interracial friendships, if you are excluding um, certain populations from your wonderful um, education, then, uh, you're all, we're all deprived. Mm -hmm. And um, I wrote about uh, the process of empathy in a really simple article for Edutopia a few years ago, where I talked about how empathy, I make a case that it's the most important back to school supply. And at the time I thought it was just very simple, easy article. And for some reason, it ended up being the most shared story on Edutopia for about four years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, it, we realized that um, it struck a nerve. And I think what ha what's happening is that we're recognizing that empathy can launch one of the most meaningful 21st century learning processes, that, like more meaningful communication, collaboration, deeper cognition. And so put together, that truly is what we need in the 21st century. And mm -hmm. Empathy, it turns out, is the thing that makes human learning powerful. And it's what creates that link to meaningful learning, and it's indispensable in building relationships. Mm -hmm. Now, th here's a quote that, that me and Homer, Homer and myself appeal to quite a bit. And it says, do not be satisfied until each one with whom you are concerned is to you as a member of your family. Regard each one as either a father, a brother, or a sister, or as a mother, or as a child. If you can attain to this, your difficulties will vanish and you will know what to do. Now think about your children. Think about people that you love. As a father, I know that I will do anything for my two daughters. I will do anything to ensure their success. I will do anything to remove any barriers to their thriving in this world. Love and empathy inspires creativity in us. It makes a way where there is no way. Think of what you would do to create an environment where your child or someone you dearly love can achieve their greatest potential. If you can generate that love between members of the human family, 
then as the quote says, your difficulties will vanish and you will know what to do. Um, you'll know what to do when it comes to allevi alleviating the suffering and the division that is taking place in the world. You know, I love this quote, not because it gives us just this one canned or clear answer. I love it because it doesn't. It is primarily about the central function of relationship, and that is to bind people together in such a way that they build a world with love as the central driving ethic. Uh, this love then sparks imagination and creativity and will produce the solution that we need to build equitable and inspiring spaces. So an important element of building that relationship is being able to communicate with each other. And that is what we see the primary function of racial literacy is. It's an ability to engage, to be honest, to build trust and empathy comes out of that. If you can't talk to each other, mm -hmm. it's gonna be hard to get very far. And so um, we've been thinking a lot about racial literacy and when there's time, we go into a lot more depth on this, but we wanna just touch on a few key terms and the way that we frame this issue. So why racial literacy matters in addition to just being able to engage. Um, Dr. Howard Stevenson, who is a really incredible scholar on this topic and has been a great mentor, um, he talks about this idea that by practicing racial literacy, we can learn to not be so fearful and learn to problem solve together rather than run away from conversations about race. So practicing racial literacy helps us to stay in the room. And um, Eric and I developed what you see on this slide is a heat index of terms. So, this is not to say these words are parallel in any way. It's not to say that they make up a continuum in terms of a definition, but really we're seeing them as a continuum in terms of the heat they produce. So over there on the cooler side, you see words like harmony, oneness, like even if you have not been involved in a racial dialogue, you can talk about oneness and harmony. It's pretty cool and comfortable. But as you move along the heat index, we start to hit words like social justice, anti-racist, anti-blackness. Notice, does the heat feel like it's rising a little bit? White fragility, white privilege, white supremacy. Those are hard words to possibly bring up in a meeting if you're seeing them. But what we want to acknowledge is sort of this metacognition of the terms. Be aware of the impact that they have and go ahead and use them. Um, and, and what we want you to consider is even if you become uncomfortable with the term, allow yourself to stay in the room, build the skill to listen when it's hard and clarify terminology even as the heat rises. So that is a really powerful skill. So we're gonna look at a couple of these in the time that we have just to offer a little introduction. All right, so here we go. Uh, this is one of our favorites, diversity. All right, <laughs> we all want it. It's what we need. Just got to have it, as Brother James Brown used to say. Well, maybe so, but maybe not so. Uh, we contend that perhaps the language that we have used to describe what we're seeking here has the potential to be quite flawed. Uh, even a little bit deceptive. So, uh, you know, let me put it this way for the people in the back of the room. Uh, the plantation was diverse, right? So I want you to take a look at a picture. What do you see here? How is diversity manifest uh, in this image? Uh, uh, here you have uh, distinct cultures. You have multiple spiritual traditions. Uh, uh, it's intergenerational, uh, you know, diversity of age. It's, it's, it's racially diverse. Uh, but what we learn from this particular image, and, and this is an image of a reservation school, uh, 
uh, that what we learn is that a space can be diverse, but filled with dysfunction, inequity, and oppression. And let's be truthful, when we say diversity, what we really have been talking about primarily is adding a dash of color to an all-encompassing, all all-pervasive white environment that we assume to be the safe and constant norm. Uh, diversity, if it remains superficial, uh, merely episodic, like pictures on a school brochure or a priority in discussion only in response to a crisis, Black History Month, all of these different things uh, can be hurtful and feel like a betrayal. So we challenge you to reimagine how diversity can become a genuine cultural value um, that is necessary for a community's health. Eric, that was uh, really um, profound how you, I'm impressed how you struck that, strung those ideas together and you, that was qu actually quite articulate of you. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, I th thanks, Homa. I, I, I think maybe. Um, well, you know, Homa, you know, since we're family, which we are kids or cousins and all of that stuff, um, you know, when I was growing up, you know, there was this thing going on, like, it, you know, the, I, I ran ho hostage crisis. Okay. I'm just going to say it. And, and, and I've always wanted to ask you, um, is, did you know any of those people that were, you know, that, that, that took any of those hostages back in the seventies? Of course not. Um, so I don't know if this translates, but I, I have to get it over with. So Eric and I are making fun of ourselves. Um, we are just showing you examples of microaggressions. What I said to him and what he said to me are examples of microaggressions. And you can think of a microaggression a little bit like, and this is one of the terms of engagement, um, to be aware of this. So you can think of it a little bit like a mosquito bite. So mosquito bites, you know, you'd get one, you hear one of these comments, maybe it's no big deal. But the reality is where there's one, there are probably many more. And you can start to build a sensitivity toward a lot of mosquito bites and, um, it can lead to much more serious conditions like West Nile virus, malaria. So when we talk about a microaggression, we really have to think about micro for who. It may not feel that micro. Mm -hmm. So let's, let me see. Hey, Homa, can, do you see that? Is that coming through? I, I, can't. I just see a blank screen. There's nothing there. Hold on, let me hold it. It might be me on my end. Can you, can you kind of see it now? Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. 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 I'm getting your point there. Yeah. Okay. I see so that th word. Yeah. So this is, you know, we're moving right on up the index right now. So uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about whiteness. Uh, it's always present, but sometimes it's quite hard to see. Uh, because it's our default perspective. And more times than not, we treat it as the neutral starting point. Well, it's far from neutral. Uh, as Berkeley professor John A. Powell says, white in America has always signified who is entitled to privilege. And in this sense, the phrase white privilege is a redundancy. When we name whiteness or call out ideas like white privilege, white rage, white supremacy, white superiority, white fragility, uh, you might feel the heat rise and not just in the language, uh, but in the room. Yeah, and in our schools, this can be manifest by taking a closer look, by recognizing the voices that we value in our assigned readings, for example. If the curriculum is dominated by white authors, we might say, oh, well, you know, we're reading the classics. But if you see whiteness, you're gonna note that the majority of the perspectives from our big, beautiful, diverse world are missing. And that does not make us richer. You know, and historically it's always been more dangerous for black people to talk about whiteness and its impact than for white people to talk about it. For white people, seeing whiteness, even saying a person is white might feel uncomfortable because it means having to admit that whiteness 
like uh, like uh, that seemingly blank screen that you saw at the beginning of our discussion on this term is not nothing. Uh, du Bois uh, said it's like a property. It's a package that comes with power and privilege. Yeah, so that means it can't always fall on people of color who clearly see whiteness to be the ones who call it out. It has to be everyone's responsibility. And taking responsibility can take many forms, like educating ourselves on the impact of whiteness. And there are so many resources out there. It can also take the form of being an active ally, but it goes deeper than that. So what if recognizing your, how your skin color affords you certain privileges to move through the world in a particular way can serve as a key to bridging the empathy gap? And Eric and I saw this play out recently. Well, before the pandemic, uh, we had the opportunity to travel. We got to travel quite a bit to present together. And um, we uh, arrived at a hotel uh, where the conference organizers had booked us. The reservations were made by the same people on the same credit card. We were checking in at the same time, same place, it took me about five minutes to check in. I went up to my room, blissful, unaware of what was going to transpire right after that. Uh, and meanwhile, you know, I'm standing in the lobby expecting the same thing to happen, but the front desk attendant questioned me on my reservation. Uh, I waited at the desk for about 45 minutes until things finally, you know, kind of cleared up. Uh, they still ended up putting the room on my card and not the client's, even though the client repeatedly told them on the phone and in emails uh, while I was standing there that it should go on their card. Over the next couple of days, we noticed this play out uh, a few more times. So we can't know if there was any malintent here, and that's not really the point of the story, but that's also how some of the insidious dividing happens between people. So this story is not about placing blame. In this case, what was noteworthy was the response of the organizer, our client. They had their radar up and they mm -hmm. wanted to make sure they did everything in their power to not perpetuate the unequal treatment. And that made a statement, a very powerful, positive statement in and of itself. Mm -hmm. They wanted to make sure that the impact on me was not devastating. They tuned in to lessen the blow uh, because they were aware of these historical patterns that, 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 that kind of really impact our behavior and they're very prevalent in our society. And they sometimes work without us even knowing it. Uh, their priority, and, and we need you to hear this, their priority was not to assess an intent that they could have never known anyway, but to address the impact that it would have on me. It even went further. Now, our client was seeking justice on my behalf and did everything that they could uh, going above uh, and beyond in their effort to make sure that I wasn't hurt. Yeah, so the way that our client was alert to the treatment of Eric made a real difference. They made themselves available uh, off hours, weekend, this was all playing out. And it's an example of how seeing racial difference is not racist. I'm gonna repeat it. Seeing mm -hmm. racial difference is not racist, it's honest. And that recognition helps contribute to profound empathy. The way that our client responded to the situation as if they were looking out for a member of their own family takes us back to that quote that Eric shared earlier, that when the care we show each other is deep, our difficulties will vanish and we will know what to do. So James Baldwin said that the role of the artist is the same as the role of the lover. If I love you, I have to make you conscious of the things that you don't see.
knew a little girl named Susie bowed as fine as costume jewelry look at her and see she had a hard time Seventeen with a three-year-old daughter Barely had a mother or father But she had a will to survive Don't you look away Turn your face Don't you run and hide Watch you, what you say, you could be living life on the other side. profound. I hope people can go back to the recording and listen again. Mm. That is very beautiful. Thank you so much. So um, we're going to take some questions. I just want to, we have a couple of announcements to make. Um, well, one, we want to just share that um, a whole topic that we didn't get to really go, we didn't get to go into are once we've announced that we said relationship is important, um, we've developed a model of how to develop real relationship. And it helps us have those hard conversations, these five elements. And we are going to go into some depth in August on the 17th and 18th, I believe it is. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. In uh, two days of two hours each um, in a workshop we call Deeper Than Diversity. 
exploring transformative principles in the quest for racial justice. So it isn't just sound bites, it goes deeper than that. And it's going to be from 10 to 12 noon Eastern time, which hopefully is a somewhat good time zone for many uh, around the world. And we have a discount code for people who are here today, BQI, Big Questions Institute 20, BQI 20 for 20% 20 off that. And then we also have a few spots left in our upcoming board and trustee and head of school superintendent virtual retreat coming up July 27, 28, 29, um, which also we kind of think two hours a day is as long as people need to be on a Zoom, but it'll be very interactive. And um, Will Richardson and I will be running the virtual retreat for boards and leadership in schools. Um, and so, uh, and that also has a 20% discount, BQI 20, um, or contact Will or me um, if you have any questions on any of this, because we are, one thing we are excited about in the midst of this crisis is the um, learning curve. There is so much learning. And so we have been immersed in reflecting and sharing and learning around all of these. So um, I want to, uh, Will has fed us some of the questions um, that we can go to. And the first one I see is how should one respond to white, is that good? We, we take questions now, okay? Is that, okay. Mm. So, okay, so how should one respond to white students, oftentimes male, who feel unsafe or uncomfortable in classrooms that strive to give greater voice to underrepresented historical perspectives? So how do we respond to those white students who feel uncomfortable by the um, voice given to underrepresented perspectives. Do you want to start with that, Eric? And, and I'll take a little stab at that too. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that, you know, one of the things that, that, that I think helps students uh, is context. Um, you, uh, you, you have to, I think, I think there is so much of our of history, our history. Uh, 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 in the United States as well as globally that is hardly ever taught in schools. I mean, as a matter of fact, a lot of that information has been systematically removed from textbooks to tell a particular story. Uh, there are so many areas uh, in education where that bias is, is, is very prevalent. Um, you know, also, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by this, by this term unsafe and uncomfortable. And I think that that, uh, you know, one day, you know, I think me, me and Homa should look into that, <laughs> that particular question, you know, because, because a lot of times what uh, 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 white students and teachers and a lot of folks feel uh, um, uh, is, is not unsafe. I mean, conversations, if, if, if you create the proper environment, uh, should be, um, uh, you know, I, I, I doubt if he really feels unsafe uh, to the extent that someone would feel uh, unsafe around, you know, say, um, I mean, come on, running through a neighborhood, uh, what we've witnessed in the, in the United States. Uh, one more thing I'll, I, will, I will say about that is that, you know, Racism uh, and discrimination does not only impact the victims of it. Uh, it, it corrupts the perpetrators of it. And, uh, you know, and that's, and that's very clear. You look at the behavior that has kind of ensued out of, you know, out of these concepts of racism, uh, uh, referring back to, to J. Marion Sims and a number of the other things that we saw. You know, uh, it, it's it, it's not it doesn't work out well for white people either, and uh, you know, and I also I also I also think that that um, that when we look at it, I think if we look at it as an environment that has that 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 makes it easier to to behave in a particular way, we can do things that even incentivize. Uh, uh, students coming into relationship. We can incentivize unity as opposed to incentivizing competition 
Uh, we can incentivize cooperation. Uh, you know, g- give them a project where the grade depends on them uh, coming to a, you know, coming to a resolution based on how well they collaborate, and that will create an opportunity, hopefully. Uh, to develop some friendships. And if, 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 if these young people can get in relationships together, then it doesn't just become black people, like this theoretical interaction with somebody that they, they thought they saw on TV, but it becomes an interaction with their friends. And if they begin to care for each other like that, I think the relationship will evolve and, 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 and some of those things will begin to dissipate. But we have to be intentional about that. Yeah, that's that's great. And I think um, there are a couple other questions that I think the answer we, we might simultaneously answer in talking mm-hmm. about this. Um, mm-hmm. There is a question about how can we make remote learning um, more intentional and, uh, you know, build that community while it's difficult in the midst of remote learning because we're not together in a building. And I think that this idea of incentivizing relationship for the sake of relationship, community for the sake of community. It's not that you are going to win necessarily. It's yes. not about a competition. So yes. if work is done understand to build understanding of each other, if work is done that specifically listens to voices that are often not heard, and in light of this question about feeling like it's unsafe for mm-hmm. Um, the person in the majority in the position of power. I, you know, I heard this expression that if you've been in the position of power, then equality feels like oppression. And, um, you know, there's, I, I think one important role of teachers, of leaders, is it goes back to metacognition. It's mm-hmm. talking about what you're going to talk about. It's being aware of what concepts are being taught and what is being learned. So if you treat your students, treat all your students with the dignity of getting to do work that matters to them, for example, Mm -hmm. they get to notice, oh, we are always, um, you know, reading uh, academic work, literature, research, that is done by, let's say, let's be honest, white Western men. And that there is so much more to the world than this. One statistic that we didn't share today that we often do is that um, indigenous people make up 5% of the world's population, but they protect 80% of the world's biodiversity. So our survival literally depends Mm -hmm. on listening to indigenous people. And there was also another question that came through about international schools. And Mm -hmm. um, will we cover material that is relevant to international schools? And Mm -hmm. we definitely will because we do take a much broader global view. And and that's my own, you know, kind of academic background is is all around global citizenship. Mm -hmm. Um, So that people understand um, these are global issues. And the Mm -hmm. fact that the protests for Black Lives Matter erupted within hours of seeing George Floyd's video shows truly how global this is. But -hmm. I think for teachers and students, and and I know we have to wrap up now, Mm -hmm. um, but I just will say this last thing, and hopefully we've integrated about five of the questions in the answering (laughs) of this one, um, that um, intentionality, making things visible, Admitting your own learning process. And I saw in the comments, somebody said, you know, I'm just waking up. That's okay. We don't want Mm -hmm. you to feel bad about that. It's wonderful that you've woken up. And now doing this work on your own, doing the reading on your own and knowing that reading a book, joining a book club, it's a step. It's not an end. It's Mm -hmm. one step in a long, this is a lifelong process. This has been going on for over 400 years. It's not mm-hmm. gonna end this semester. We realize educators are under a great deal of stress, but what if establishing some semblance of unity in an intentionality around going deeper than just mm-hmm. a statement on diversity is actually a way to build a much stronger community than you ever could have imagined, even if you were all together in one place. 
So yes. I'll end with that thought. And mm -hmm. Eric, if you have any final thought, um, and maybe we'll mm -hmm. turn it over to Will as well, who's been patiently yeah. uh, producing and helping out with all of this behind the scenes. Yes. Well, that, uh, you know, uh, just a, just a quick point. You know, as, as you saw from the presentation, the, these these issues are very very nuanced. And you know, for, for like if you if you have white students that are trying to kind of wrap their heads around some of these issues, you know, just like we can't stereotype, um, uh, you know, black students. You know, white folks have been dealt with in a particular way when it when it comes to race and if you start if you begin to look at laws surrounding these issues what whites have historically been punished when they wanted to move toward unity uh, you know you have uh, in, in america we had the abolitionist movement um, you know there were a number of movements across the planet that that where where you had people in multi-racial uh collaborations and the white and the white students were punished uh, uh, in a, in a lot of these movements, just as the black students were. So white children need to know that history. They need to know that they can defect from that type of behavior. That 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 is not you know that that all white people were not beating black people down, but there were some that stood up for justice and that there always have been. That would be one thing that, that, that you could uh, inject in, into your curriculum. But we, but we thank you all so much for, um, for, for, for being here today. And, uh, you know, as Homa said, you know, th this is a global issue. I mean, you know, when we talk about, you know, Britain and imperialism, colonialism and Canada and the US, they're all cousins. So, you know, they were doing kind of the same thing. So, so you know, I remember living in Canada, any of my Canadian brothers and sisters here, one of the things that people used to say to me all the time is that, oh, well, we're not as bad as the US. And I would say, well, that's a low standard. <laughs> you know, shouldn't use the US as a standard. So, so we, we get into all of those nice little things. So no matter where you're from, I, I, there are probably people that sit on the margins in your society, no matter where your school is. And so there, uh, there are probably many teachable moments. You just have to search for them. So thank you all for being here with us this morning. Well, let me just jump in and wrap it up. That was amazing, you guys. Thanks so much, Homa and Eric, um, for your passion to this conversation. And I know that people in the chat were asking all sorts of questions that we didn't get to. So Eric, you don't know this, but we're going we're gonna to get you to spend a little bit more time maybe on a podcast, having a, yeah. a little bit more of a conversation around these because there were so many really great questions. But Wonderful. Um, to those of you who are watching, thanks so much for being here today. Really appreciate it. There'll be a follow-up email probably in the next day or so with a link to the archive and some other information about the stuff that we're, we're doing to try to move this conversation forward. But uh, your, your being here today is a big part of that. So thanks so much. And we will see you guys later online. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.